Welcome to the 2009 First Robotics Competition and this year's game, Lunacy. Lunacy is played on a 27 by 54 foot field known as the Crater. Alliances of three teams each are positioned in bases at each end of the field from where they control their robots. Additional player stations are located along the edges of the Crater. The Crater is covered with a slick polymer material called Regolith that provides a unique surface for the robots to drive upon. Special wheels are used on the robots to create a low friction interaction with the regolith. This simulates the low traction effects of driving in the 1 6 gravity on the surface of the moon. Lunacy uses three types of game pieces known as moon rocks, empty cells, and supercells. A trailer is attached to each robot. The trailers are the targets for the opposing alliance. The objective of the game is to get as many moon rocks and supercells into the opposing trailers as possible. At the start of the game, human players known as payload specialists are positioned in the outpost stations. Each robot is placed on their launch pad with the trailer touching the wall of the crater. Robots are able to start the game with up to seven moon rocks in their possession. During the autonomous period, players in the corner fueling stations and the outposts attempt to launch moon rocks into moving trailers. Each robot starts in a launch pad in front of an opposing player. As robots start to move away, the other alliance may try to block the robot's progress to make them easy targets. Or, robots may use their cameras to track the vision targets on top of each trailer. This allows them to track and score in the opponent's trailers. At the end of the autonomous period, human pilots step forward to take the controls. During the tele-operated period of the game, pilots guide the robots as they attempt to launch moon rocks into the trailers of the opposing alliance. Meanwhile, human payload specialists will also attempt to score moon rocks into passing trailers. Robots can also recycle game pieces back to the payload specialists. With a low friction playing surface, robots will slide easily and high speed collisions will be common. Bumpers are necessary to prevent damage. The outpost payload specialists can also deliver special empty cells to their robots. The robots then deliver these empty cells to their fueling stations. At the fueling station, the empty cells are exchanged for supercells. During the last 20 seconds of the match, humans or robots can score bonus points by getting supercells into opposing trailers. Each scored moon rock or empty cell is worth 2 points, and each supercell is worth 15 points in the game. Good luck, and we'll see you at the competitions. video we're going to show is an introduction to the, the first program so you have an idea of why it's worth it to be involved in it even if you're mildly interested. You guys have 40 seconds left. Oh, no, 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 just keep pushing me. Oh my god. In science fiction, they are often cast as the enemy. Here, a team's fate lies in their balance. A competition teaming bright young minds with cutting edge technology. Robots are built to withstand virtually anything. Humans are not. In this arena, minor malfunctions can lead to major heartbreaks. Oh my god, our battery's so down. Months of work. Stop that, dead. This is not science fiction. This is not man versus machine. This is first. Every year, thousands of young minds compete at the first championship. The largest and most prestigious competition of its kind. First, or for inspiration and recognition of science and technology, was founded by inventor Dean Kamen. 
to inspire young people's interest and participation in science and technology. The problem is that so many kids grow up in an environment where by the time they're 10 or 12 years old, they think their options in the world are being in the NBA or being in Hollywood. That's their perspective of the world. It seemed to me that what we needed to do to get first going was to break the stereotypical mindset given to kids about what's important in our culture. First challenges young people to think, create, and inspire. Working with professional engineers and other mentors, students design, build, and program robots for competition. It's transforming the way they think about science and engineering. Let these kids that have never met a scientist or a professional engineer see what these people do. Put those people and ideas in front of these kids. You'll change where they put their time and attention and you'll change the outcome. You'll change what they'll be when they're 17. A few of these CEOs said, Dean, what are you going to do that'll make kids more passionate about science or engineering? I said, let's steal from the playbook of sports. Let's create a sporting event. In 1992, 28 teams competed in a small New Hampshire gymnasium. Off the field. To them. Today, the championship is known as the Super Bowl of Smarts. A culmination of the first robotics competition for high school students, the first Lego League for middle school students, and the first Vex Challenge. It's the Lego. We put into it a few things that I think sports could learn from gracious professionalism they work together you help your opponent you want to win but you want to win a close match we have a culture here that causes people to work together more than 2500 sponsors support first and over eight million dollars in scholarship opportunities are available Over 40,000 volunteers donate time and talent. First advisor and MIT professor of mechanical engineering, Woody Flowers, knows FIRST is all about conquering a challenge. I think it turns out that humans like a really tough challenge. And I think FIRST has proven unambiguously that if you create an environment in which the right stuff is celebrated, people will do that. So these people get to work really hard, compete like crazy, but treat each other well in the process. It's a good thing. Larry Page, co-founder of Google, recognizes the power of FIRST as much as anyone. My dad actually smuggled me into a robotics conference when I was 12. He thought it was really important that you know, I would learn about robotics and technology and get to experience that. And I think FIRST has done that you know, on a tremendous scale. Kids getting first-hand experience with technology, with practicing engineers. And um, from my perspective, that's how you accomplish amazing things. 10 or 15 or 20 years from today, some kid in those stands will have cured Alzheimer's or AIDS or cancer or built an engine that doesn't pollute. Somebody sitting out there is going to win a Nobel Prize and they're going to be asked, what made you go down this road? The probability that one of them is going to do something spectacular that they would not have done without first is almost a guarantee. Look at these kids. They're, they're the future. We're part of it by helping them figure out what to do with their lives. Hey, it's Jam and if you uh, want to see that video again, if you go to usfirst.org, you're able to either stream it or uh, download it. Okay, so I'm just going to give a brief introduction uh, for our team and then I'll turn it over to Lucas and Allie. Um, just some background, I think I already mentioned to you guys already that we um, are in our third year, so we have two completed seasons. Um, our team usually consists between 15 and 25 students, 
and that really just depends upon, um, I know a lot of our other students are involved, involved in other you know, sports and band and theater, so we, are, we try to be very flexible. Um, like I said before, the team is student-led. Um, you know, there is help from teachers and mentors and engineers, but we really try to keep uh, the, you know, students in the driver's seat as much as possible so they come up with the ideas and, you know, test out different prototypes and such. Um, we work really well together, and because we allow this flexibility uh, within our schedules, I think we're able to draw more students than versus if we just said, okay, you're robotics and only robotics. So um, I think that's worked out very well. Some tips for a first-year team, if you guys do decide to start the team, um, try to get an idea of people's interests and talents early. Um, I know there are just some people out there that are really mechanically minded or very electrically, or they might be the techie type. If you identify the kind of person you are up front, then you can really get your niche uh, early. Um, figure out the schedule when you can get your core group together. You know, for example, I said we have a flexible schedule, but we always try to make sure we have a mechanical person, a, a programming person, electrical person on hand at each time, because that way the team keeps progressing. Okay. Uh, you also want to start talking to potential mentors and members of the community. You would be surprised how many you know, people and businesses in, in your community would just love to help out with this. They love sharing knowledge and love to show uh, people uh, what they know. Uh, also, especially with your first year, you want to treat everything as a learning experience. If you talk to some of our members, they'll tell you our first year we hit a lot of you know, bumps in the road, but. The key is not having the perfect robot and you know, winning every competition is actually learning. And I think if you talk to these members, you'll, you'll find that they've learned a tremendous amount in just you know, a year for some, two years for others. Um, also, one of the biggest tips I can give uh, any teacher or even students, there is a website that Team 341, uh, they put out a video that shows you a lot of ins and outs of a first year season. So if anybody's interested, I know it's difficult to write this web address now, but I can provide you that information at, um, after the presentation. Okay, at this point, oh, one more thing. Uh, we have a former student that made a couple comments that I thought were pretty key. Um, some of the benefits that he thought uh, increases interest in math and science, okay? If you ever thought math and science was the least bit interesting, this is actually gonna reinforce and really make you more interested in your studies. Uh, it reinforces classroom learning, and it teaches time management skills, which is valuable for everybody. Whether or not you plan on going to college or plan on getting a job right out of high school, time management is some key information. Uh, it teaches interpersonal skills. Uh, I'm sure you know by now that you don't get along with every person you know, on the planet, but you will have to learn how to work with uh, people. So it teaches very good interpersonal skills, and also learning to work in a team environment. Okay, so at this point, I'd like to call Lucas on over and he'll give you a little bit of his experiences. Uh, first of all, let's say I'm Lucas. <laughs> all right, um, basically, my name's Lucas Salmon. I'll be a junior in Highland this year. This will be my third year this upcoming season, and uh, like on the robotics team. Uh, the reason I joined was I was a freshman and I wanted to get involved. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of clubs and stuff, and this just looked like a good fit. I've always loved building things and solving problems, and I've always been interested in technology and stuff. Alright, basically this is how I'm going to run it. I'm just going to give you guys an account of my experiences in, on the team. First year, was, uh, this is the build season. We start out at what's called the kickoff. This is after the mentioned it. There's uh, the first Saturday after we come back. There's a big kickoff, and they show you that video that we saw earlier, the very first one. And that explains what your task is going to be. Basically, it's six weeks your build season, and pretty much all the work gets done in the last two or three. First three weeks, you guys kind of get your team organized, get all your ideas together. And I like the word organized chaos, the phrase, because that's pretty much what it is. There's always something going on. It's pretty crazy. You try to keep it as organized as you want, but I mean, it doesn't always work. There's 
tons of different people coming in and out. Like you said, we're really flexible, so there are different people all the time. It's pretty chaotic. Um, basically, when you work with the stuff, you become familiar with the robot parts and stuff because I don't know if any of you guys have any other like experience with any of this stuff. I didn't, so I had no clue what it is. The parts work, and how do you work with them? You get, like, I don't know, you get familiar with them. You know what everything is. That's cool. <laughs> I uh, good quote, experience is your best teacher, but not the most efficient. So you end up doing a lot of research. But it's not bad research because you're learning for yourself and you're not doing it for a project for like a teacher or anything. And the more you really dive into it, the more you get pulled in. Uh, my favorite thing about building robots and stuff is you take a good idea, you whisk it on paper and stuff, and you have to figure out how to make it mechanically possible. Basically, I don't know why this is our second year up here, but um, all right, so we'll go second year. Second year is slightly more organized chaos. It begins as soon as your competition ends, everybody starts brainstorming and stuff, and you have leaders that develop from your first year. The team starts gaining more structure, you get a mechanical side of things, and electrical programming, like that. Uh, like a hierarchy kind of. Uh, the schools, I mean, you guys probably won't have a problem with this if you're going to be a math and science school, but our school really wasn't too involved in the first year. The second year we got a lot more school support and recognition and like pep rallies and stuff. And that was, uh, you build on the first year's experience, learn more, and it leads to greater opportunities. All right, these are just some pictures of us building. And uh, basically, you, you have a shipping deadline. And pretty much the last few nights, everything's crammed together. She has so many good ideas. And it's, it's hard because your robot's evolving and stuff. And you gotta cut it off. Uh, it comes too quickly. And I can guarantee that everybody who's really interested and we'll probably spend the night until like midnight or later on the night prior to ship. And for a time being, the chaos stops. And everybody takes a breath for the first time in two or three weeks. And then you get to the competition, which is the fun part. Um, chaos begins again. You saw some of those competitions. It's crazy. There are people everywhere, and they're yelling and screaming with music and mascots and loudspeakers. And Basically, it's like it's a sporting event. You won't find any more enthusiastic people anywhere. There's the pits, which is basically where you pick your robot up, and then there's the playing field. Uh, it's a very competitive atmosphere, but it's yet professional, so you help out your other teams and stuff. I uh, can't really describe it. You guys just kind of have to go to one and figure it out for yourself. Here's some pictures of our competition, the mascots. And then here's Ali. Hi guys, I'm Ali. I um, was in robotics last year, it was my first year. So um, now that I've been in it for one year, I've been able to see some things um, that we could improve and some things that might help you as a first year team. So I have some tips. Ooh. So your basics, your team. How should you split it up? Um, where would you fit on the team? Um, I can show you how we broke it down. We had a mechanical, electrical, program, marketing team. If you're wondering what those are, like your mechanical team, they um, focus on like a physical structure of the robot, putting it together, um, building the design, like the parts. And then your electrical, they focus on like power supply, things like that. Programming, that's your brain of the robot. And marketing, they tie up all other loose ends. Um, they work on advertising for your team. And that comes more into play when you're actually at the competition. And I'll talk about that a little more later. But, um, if, like, for instance, I'm on mechanical, and I like to do this. I'm interested in working with my hands and um, just like problem solving things. You'll get that with pretty much every aspect of robotics, but um, that's one good thing about mechanical. 
um, programming. If you're interested in going into engineering, like maybe being a computer software engineer, being in the programming sector, it would be very beneficial to you. Um, in marketing, if you're um, interested in business or maybe sales, things like that, marketing also gives you a lot of experience with that. Um, and if you don't fit into uh, any of these, that's okay. Um, there's room to rise for everybody. Last year at our competition, I don't know if you saw, um, we had to shoot like these moon rock things into moving baskets. So we needed a basketball player. And so there's room for pretty much anybody. Um, so you can find your place in your niche and then just focus your energy on that. Okay, the work, the nitty gritty stuff. Um, some things that will help your team be successful um, are like, you want to plan, as soon as you get your prompt, you want to start having planned um, sketches, designs, um, whether you use like CAD or inventory programming, or if you just like sketch on a piece of paper. Um, this will save you a lot of time, um, because we would, like last year, if we designed a plan and then it didn't really work right, we could adjust the plan instead of like adjusting the whole project. Um, and then when you have your design, then you can get your prototype um, and then start working your kinks out of that by using like guest and chat. And while doing all these things, like Mr. Rankin said, you want to make sure you have, you manage your time um, because you don't want to be like working up to the last minute crunch time. Um, this way you can work everything out at a good pace and just make sure your robot is ready to go on time. Okay, so what can you gain from robotics? Um, some things that I've noticed is you will be able to gain a lot of problem solving skills, you're on the kind of team, medical skills, um, and just in general, an engineering foundation with anything you would want to do in engineering, basically. Um, for instance, I was on the chemical team and, you know, I didn't really know much about an Allen wrench or any tools in general. And by being on robotics, I was able to learn about those tools and work with them, and I soon became more familiar with them, and you can too. Okay, now the fun part. Lucas already kind of talked about this, but I thought I'd throw some tips out. Um, just some things you should watch out for. At the competition, um, as you can see in this picture, there's like an arena, and that's pretty intense, like he said. It's basically like a basketball game or something. Um, and then on the other side of that curtain, you can't see it in the picture, but it, it basically looks like a college fair or like a career fair. There are a bunch of booths set up for each team, and that's where you have a pit to work on your robot to fix it when it's, it breaks down or it's pretty town. Um, so you'll spend most of your time in the pit, and then other teams, you'll get to meet the other teams who will come around and scout and see which teams are the best. And, um, this is where marketing comes in. You want to um, have like a good appearance, good advertising on your food, so that people will remember your team when it comes time to form alliances. Um, you want to obviously be on the winning team's alliance, and if they like you and they remember you, then that's helpful. Um, so yeah, like I said, it's important to make your food look good and um, just to look professional when you're in your booth as well. Because judges also come around all the time and they ask you questions about your robot and um, be sincere and professional. And um, chances are you'll make a lot of friends, like with other teams. Everyone has, everyone's really friendly there. They're all there to have fun. Um, so that's the good thing about it. And um, lastly, the important thing is to just make sure you prep your team before um, your competition, just so that in case judges do come up and ask members um, questions about your robot, you're prepared to answer them. Um, and, and also just to be able to explain what it does to other teams so they can go you know, pick you and stuff. So um, I hope to see you guys at the competition and be a fun. demonstration and uh, just to kind of remind you of that first video you saw the purpose of the robot this past season 
was to take these things called the orbit balls and shoot them in a moving trailer. So our robot would, would have had a trailer attached to it with a big basket, and you're basically trying to follow and chase moving robots. Now we don't have a trailer here with us, but you can probably imagine that you know it's pretty difficult to go out and, and track down a robot and shoot these balls inside of that trailer. Now, one thing I wanted to tell you is when we started this robot, we by no means thought this is what we were going to end up with. We started in phases, we uh, first got something drivable, then we had something, a mechanism that has an air compressor that charges a cylinder that shoots the ball, and then we had a, a robot that could shoot a ball, but we didn't have a way to get it off the ground all the way up here, so we developed this mechanism that works like a pitching machine. It's uh, wheels that spin in opposite directions and a uh, ball comes in and it basically shoots it up this rail down this PVC and then there's a flap that when a button's pressed releases the ball in here. So we're going to have these guys go ahead and do a demo. If you guys have questions about the presentation first or the robot, we'll have a few minutes to uh, you know, field some questions. So if you guys want to start it off. Okay, we're waiting for the, uh, oh, there it goes. So right now what you're hearing is the compressor charging up a um, air pressure and a cylinder. And um, I'm assuming you guys will have a chance to come by at some point to see, see it up close. Um, but what we're going to demonstrate here is first, uh, they're going to shoot this ball. Go ahead and shoot it on the highest, um, whenever, go ahead and shoot it. Okay. Um, so that was one function of it. Now they're going to drive up to this ball. Let's get, some of these balls are pretty beat up to the competition. And they're going to try to get, um, we'll put two or three right in a row. Hmm. The uh, competition where we had to take some of these balls and give them to our teammates so they could also reverse. Please go ahead and set a few up. questions either about the program or about the robots or um, I think you guys will be able to see some of our members again with the badges at lunch. If you've got questions for them, feel free to ask them. That's what yes, question. Okay, the question is where do we get the parts to build the robot? Now at the beginning of each season, once you register, you're given two crates of just motors, gears, uh, aluminum, just a bunch of basic parts. But that's not all you can use. You could go to Home Depot or Lowe's and ask them, hey, we've got a robotics team. Would you be willing to donate some sheet metal or some aluminum? And it's really up to you. They'll give you a base set of parts, but you can pretty much put anything as long as it's within the guidelines, and there's some pretty loose guidelines. But you know, I've seen people, last year there was a team that had a giant fan, and it made it like a hovercraft, so it would glide around. It, because it was a low friction surface. So nobody else had that idea, but because they fell in the guidelines, they were able to use basically a giant fan to propel it. Good question. Anyone else? Okay, I guess we'll see you at lunch, and if you have any, uh, Chris, do you want to? First of all, round of applause to these guys. 